Bits and Bricks. Welcome to Bits and Bricks, a podcast about all things Lego games. I'm Ethan Vincent. And I'm Brian Crescenti. Together, we look back at the rich 25-year history of Lego games, chat with early developers as well as seasoned studios who have all tackled the creation of video games for one of the most popular and respected toy companies in the world, the Lego Group. So, Brian, I know we spend a lot of time discussing LEGO video games, you know, the big ones, uh, the popular ones, but how much do you know about some of the LEGO group's less well-known physical toys? Uh, Well, I'm a a big fan of the bricks. Uh, You know, I have built a lot of the sets. I spent the holidays building sets. And I do know that they started out as wood. Is that what you're talking about? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the LEGO Group's Scala line, specifically the 1998 run of Scala figures. LEGO Scala! New adventure of the Scala family! Dad, can I have a birthday party? No, Lisa. LEGO Scala! Oh, it's unfair. What are you doing, darling? Oh, a little surprise for Lisa. Lisa, come down. Happy birthday, Lisa. Lego Scala family. Lego Scala. Lego, Lego Scala. Oh, yes, the Lego dolls. Yeah. Such, such a weird product. Yeah. They weren't really compatible with the traditional brick either. No, they, they even had, you know, clothes and accessories. It was very, you know, unique and different than the minifig for sure. Yeah, it, it was an era for the Lego group uh, and one that came about around the same time that the person we're speaking with today was brought on to do a, a bit of research surrounding how girls interact with the Lego brick and software and video games. That's right. And we're talking to Elena Caton. She was brought on to do research into this issue in particular and kind of kicking off her career at the Lego group that would include work on a number of things. Uh, you know, she worked on SPU Dark. Darwin, the Darwin Group, uh, worked on toy-enabled games. And our topic today, she worked on the original 1999 LEGO Friends PC game. Yeah, for those of you not familiar, uh, LEGO Friends was this wonderful, sometimes overlooked LEGO game gem uh, designed to inspire girls to explore their creativity. Uh, But before work on the game was able to get started, Caton, uh, who today is head of digital products and innovation at this London-based group. Now, get get ready for this, Ethan. (laughs) The Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music. Uh, That's where she works today. But at the time, uh, obviously was doing work for the Lego group, and she had to conduct research into the type of experiences that would make sense for uh, a game that they wanted to create for girls. Yeah, and maybe as a side note here, Brian Wright, uh, this is a special listener-requested episode, Uh, something we hope to do more as we continue throughout the season. But we had several people ask to hear about Lego Friends. Uh, So, of course, we called up Elena Caton, and uh, this is our conversation that we had with her about the original CD-ROM game, Lego Friends. I had completed my uh, MA in Interactive Design at the Center for Interactive Media, and I had been working at HarperCollins on CD-ROMs for children, educational CD-ROMs. And I had been working very closely with Adriana Isagiri, who was then a producer at the Lego Group, and brought me in to, to look at the um, electronic games uh, and uh, video games market for girls. This was 1997, and I think the remit was to, um, well, I think it was twofold. First, it was to bridge the gap uh, with the girls' market, because research shows that Whereas the Lego brand was very much used by boys and girls up to the age eight, from eight onwards, boys uh, continued uh, involved to be involved with the, with the Lego brand, whereas girls dropped off completely and uh, disassociated from it. So that was one aspect of it. And the second aspect was that the Lego group was conscious that, you know, in, in the mid to late 90s, the computer games market was widening and taking up a lot of playtime that was not being used in with Lego bricks. So it's interesting. Uh, those are two obviously very important topics. And, and when we're talking about uh, the mid to late 90s, that's sort of, sort of when video gaming uh, and gaming on PCs began to flourish. I know in 98, uh, roughly, according to some studies, about uh, a third 
of of people who played games a lot were were uh, female or girls or women. And in the next year, that jumped up to f- more than forty uh, percent. So there was this sort of increase. So when you were looking at these topics, uh, did you sort of separate them into physical and digital play, or were you sort of examining both together? I was mostly based on uh, the digital play and looking at computer games, but also use of software. How do girls mostly relate to software? Uh, because um, I mean, I can't remember the exact details because this was almost what, 20 years ago. But um, right. I think one of the areas that I thought uh, chimed with the Lego brand was that girls tend to use uh, software, uh, you know, younger girls from the ages of eight onwards, um, as a creative collaboration and communication tool. And that chimed with, you know, the, the creative play values of the Lego group. So when you were looking at this, uh, was there an idea that it was going to lead to the creation of a game? Or what was the hopeful output of, of this research you were doing? So I, I've i been looking through my files to, to see if I could um, sort of disinter my report. But I think I responded to senior management at the Lego group with a, a, a series of concepts that could be taken up. And I don't remember exactly what they were, but they were to do with customization, creation, communication. Uh, It it was a series of creative activities that could be undertaken as a sort of creative construction play online. Um, And I think that was the basis for Lego Friends and that continued exploration. But I have to say that the the catalyst for Lego Friends was the fact that at the time, the Lego group was really pushing their scala sub brand so lego scala was a was a brand that had um, dolls essentially and these dolls were a bit like barbies they were barbie like they had hair they had clothes they were not like minifigs at all right. and the whole aesthetic was was very different from that of the traditional lego brand and in fact i mean i don't know i think it did quite well in germany but on the whole scala was not a successful brand and it had a ju- just a few years um, lifespan. And and, and I, I'm assuming on top of this, we're talking about an era for the Lego Group where there have only been maybe a half dozen games that had come out. So uh, Lego Fun to Build, of course, was sort of an outlier. But you had Island, Loco, Chess, and Creator, uh, and that was it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Was that was that a challenge for you in in terms of gaming? Was it a challenge for you to come to them and say? Not only should we create something that is more focused on girls, but also we want to make a game. I think when I was called in, the necessary strategy conversations had happened at the Lego group and the direction had been taken. And I was brought in as an individual. I mean, at the time I had set up a a limited company. It was me and and my business partner. Uh, But they called me to kind of develop this proposition further. But the positioning for the product and the space that it wanted to occupy strategically was was predetermined. I was responding to a brief in that respect. How did you feel was the environment at the Lego group? Now, obviously, you're in London, like you said, but, you know, Lego Island had been kind of the first video game breakthrough uh, for the Lego group. And do you feel like on the heels of that, there was, you know, this this excitement to continue video games? And as you feel that that's kind of the reason it, it um, that, you know, the Lego group approached you about um, making this game? Oh, yes, I think there was definitely uh, an impetus for getting into the video games market. Um, But we were a little bit the outsiders because if if you look at, you know, uh, Riders, Lego Island, um, they were 3D games. They were very construction based and usually they were undertaken by by American companies. Hmm. So I don't know in terms of budget, but something tells me that we probably had a smaller budget and it was decided to keep it very local. So, yeah. you know, the the developer is a Danish company, uh, Ole Ivanov, which were great. The animation was done in a in a small uh, Copenhagen studio. I, I my company in London was two people. Hmm. Uh, we had a freelance writer. 
And then we had Adriana Isaguirre, the Lego producer, who was the yeah. really the only Lego employee directly involved in the project and holding it all together and, you know, doing a fantastic job of it. So it, it was definitely an exciting time, but I wonder whether we were slightly siloed in, in the kind of Scala girls world, if you want. So were you looking at the Scala line when you were designing Lego Friends in, in 1999? It was loosely based on Scala because the Lego group had not resolved the brand issues with girls. The problem for girls after eight years old was that there was not a clear aesthetic and a clear play mode that had been articulated. And it it was being explored, really. And what this game was supposed to do is further that exploration into the digital domain. So as a starting point, what we took is what does Scala bring to the original Lego brand? And then what is it that girls want to do when they're online, when they're playing, and when they relate to each other? And based on that, we we develop the main components of the game, which are the interactive narrative, the creative activities, and the kind of creation aspect around it. Okay, Brian, let's take a little break here and maybe uh, travel back in time to 1999, you know. Um, Let's listen to some of the game, dive into Lego Friends, the PC game, and listen to the sounds of this game. Hello, welcome to Lego Friends. Sunnyvale's a great place where there's lots to do. I'm sure you'll get along with my friends, Jules, Mimi, Anita, and Emma. You're here just in time. It's Emma's birthday. And she thinks we forgot. Just be nice to her this time. Yeah, remember last year? So, what was wrong with giving her a basketball? Just that it was about the last thing she wanted. Maybe we should go over to Anita's basement and check out her dancing for the gig. Yay! Yay! So yeah, tons of stuff going on in this game. Uh, there's a storyline, I guess. There's yeah. different things happening. Tell me a little bit about this game. Uh, explain it to me. Yeah, so there are these sort of elements, these things that you could do in the game while you're playing, but it is all tied together with this wonderful storyline featuring uh, these four central, well, five central girls. Yeah. And it has this really great art style. I love it. It, it looks sort of like it, it was done by this uh, small animation uh, group that that uh, hand drew everything. Yeah, uh, kind of looks like a little bit uh, a mix between maybe Scooby Doo and the Magic Bus. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I would say it's digitally traced, maybe too. I mean, it has that two D style. Like, it's definitely not you know three D CGI kind of graphic stuff, but it's. Yeah, it's it's very organic in in how it presents itself, and it, it's very cartoon like, you know. Yeah, and and to correct myself, I did mean uh, the Magic School Bus, not the Magic Bus that wonderful Who song. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's, it's really cool. You like, basically you you go into these different areas, these buildings that are presented to you in a map. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're look, kind of looking down at the town of Sunnyvale and you're able to go to like the auditorium or you can go mm-hmm. to this friend's basement or you can go to like a little soda shop. And when you go to these different places with your friends, they each sort of unlock different options. So for instance, you can create your own song. Um, And the way you do this is each of your friends plays an instrument Mm -hmm. and uh, and you have these like little rectangles that you can drag and drop down to fill, I guess, what would be maybe the the beats of the song. Uh Um, And so, for instance, you could go in and say on the first beat, I'm going to have the guitar, the piano, the bass, the drums, and the singer all doing something. Yeah. Um, Or you can kind of mix and match it. And then each, each of those people have different sort of notes or sounds that they make. Yeah, and it's very reminiscent of, you know, something like GarageBand, these these audio samples that you kind of drag onto, I guess, these squares, right, Brian? Yeah, yeah, and uh, it, it allows you to create uh, what I think is a pretty, you know, 
pretty good song. Like it, yeah. it, the results are pretty neat. And then they so they have this music option, but to make things even I think cooler, they also have the the ability for you to choreograph a dance. Mm -hmm. And so same sort of idea. You go in and you choreograph your dance by dragging icons down and and filling out how you want the dance to go. And then you can kind of watch the performance in a practice session. So like you can watch all your friends and yourself performing this song while the singer dances yes. uh, to the, again, the, the dance you've you've created. Yeah, and, and so what are they preparing for, Brian? I guess that's the big setup question, question mark, right? Yeah, it's the big dance, of course, in the auditorium. Um, yes. This also introduces another thing, which you don't, you don't see a lot of. You see a lot of dancing games and a lot of music games. What you don't see are games based on stage design, yeah. which I think is, again, another really cool thing. So you go in and you literally create the stage design for your performance yes. uh, in the auditorium. And then you can, same thing, you're doing a lot of dragging and dropping. Um, but, you know, between those three elements that have so many different ways to express yourself, you can really create your own very unique thing. Yes, and girl bands in 1999 was a thing. What's the name of this girl band? Uh, tough Stuff. Um, not, not to be confused with uh, the Spice Girls. Yes, exactly, yeah. Cool, so... Quite an interesting game and a storyline and everything. And uh, obviously, we get back into our conversation talking about maybe the the innovation of this game and the fact that this was really offering maybe some new things for a targeted grilled PC game. <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I'm assuming that while there's a, a pretty big fan base for this game, even though it came out in 99, there are a lot of people, I think, who've grown up and have fond memories of it. Um, how did you come up with these ideas? They're really uh, ahead of their time in many ways. Well, I think we were. And in fact, you know, when you look at the current apps market uh, in particular and online gaming, the, a lot of the features that we developed quite early on have picked up and become products in their own right. So uh, I, I was looking through my notes uh, that I, you know, found in a box in my garage. And I realized looking through the original concept documents that we had a lot of activities uh, to begin with, a lot of which did not make it into the game because um, it would have been incredibly bloated. So we had a magazine making, we had a, a makeover style game, and uh, we had a dog training activity with the dog Botcher. Wow, cool. And, you know, it became clear that the product was ballooning uh -huh. and we sort of brought it down to the music activities and creating, you know, the big performance. Yeah. At this time, girl bands were very big. You know, the Spice Girls were incredibly popular. So it was, it was part of the zeitgeist. Oh, right. And I think what was really, really important is that we wanted to create relatable characters yeah. and we wanted to root the gameplay in, in narratives. Looking at the product now, I think it, despite all this, I think it was still a bit inflated in terms of functionality. I think the dance and the music activity in their own right carry the game, as do the interactive narratives. Um, and the idea was that you could explore the different locations. You would go into a location and trigger a narrative uh, randomly from a bank and different of uh, sort of mini episodes. And then that narrative would lead you to have to complete an activity, uh, which would be music, dance or uh, stage setting. And then when you came out of that activity, the kind of the end of that uh, narrative would play and either lead on to another activity or onto another narrative. And we built in some sort of um, interaction triggers via the phone. It, this was, you know, before mobile phones were pervasive. Right, right. And so it was really cool that there was a phone that would call you as you were playing in the game and interrupt you and, and kind of give you uh, play prompts. Did you, when you were looking at uh, doing things like this sort of plug and play music creation, w were there any games out there or experiences out there that you, you looked to or were these things that you just conceived of completely on your own? So this was uh, uh, collaboratively um, created. I, my focus was on the interaction design and in the character development and the kind of the game bible the technical aspects of the music creation activity were very much uh, led by Ole Ivanov's studio. And 
you know, I think what they created really is a, is a cut down version of, of a synth for children where you could actually create really cool tunes using samples. Right. right. So I don't know if you had a chance to play with the game or, or look at videos of it, of it, but what you've got is a mixing disc and you can set the key and the harmony and then you can drag the, the, pieces that actually look like Scala pieces, they've got Scala symbols on them, to uh, fill fill in that bar. Right. And you can change key and you can change tempo. So it was actually quite, you could compose quite cool tunes. And we, I think uh, vocals were recorded with a, a professional singer and professional musician. So, you know, it was a high, the, 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 the music that you created was pretty high quality. And then you had the ability to take the track that you had produced and synchronize it with dance moves. And the clever thing was that everything was timed to go inside in the bar. So if you if you dragged and dropped <laughs> a dance move uh, for your choreography, it would be in time with the with the music track that you had just composed. Right, right. And you could then take it to the auditorium and make the light show and the slideshow in the stage to be in time with the music and the dance. So really, you, you were designing a show. It's amazing. I, I, I didn't get a chance to play it, but I was watching some videos, and it, it really is impressive how you all were able to create this sort of drag-and-drop system that results in these pretty complex songs and dances um, and the animation, uh, I like the animation style. What made you guys decide to use that form of animation? Um, I mean, it, it is quite interesting. I, to be honest, I do not know how it, it ended up uh, being so analog. I mean, and when I say analog, I mean 100% analog. The animation was done using a, a, a Danish animation studio called Tiny Film, which do, to this day, sell animation uh, pretty much, well, uh, definitely in the 90s, it was on paper. So every animation sequence was actually drawn, pencil and paper, and then um, colored and uh, and sort of edited digitally. And I think that was because Scala was breaking with the, with the traditional Lego brand sort of look and feel of polished plastic and, uh, you know, minifigs with no joints. Like I said, it, it, you know, it, it is aesthetic that I think has been abandoned now by the Lego group because not even the Lego Friends uh, toys uh, continue with that aesthetic. But, but it was dolls with hair that wore clothes that were quite soft. Um, right. I, I've just been looking through my uh, samples and, you know, and, and the backgrounds and the textures are watercolors that were inspired on the Scala catalogue. So I think that was the reason. Yeah, it's uh, it's impressive. I mean, the end result is something that almost feels like uh, a Saturday morning cartoon when you're watching the results of them dancing. And even the cutscenes. I think uh, the voice acting really does sound like kids talking as opposed to some of the modern stuff you get where it sounds like adults putting on a kid's voice. Yes, I think that one of the, uh, the things that really worked with uh, Lego Friends was the interactive narratives and, and the web of interactive narratives that led on to and supported the, uh, the activities. And this, uh, the credit has to go to Maureen Hazelhurst, which is a, a British author um, who actually wrote the narratives. And, and we had, you know, lengthy brainstorming sessions in Denmark at the Tiny Film Studio in Copenhagen, where we actually came up with a character Bible and identified, you know, the different uh, characters that we were going to give the girls and things like, you know, we came up with ideas like uh, the type of village it had to be. Um, obviously, the Lego group had a lot of input in terms of the audience that they wanted to target, hence, the, you know, the, this American style um, town where they live, Sunnyvale. And, uh, you know, the environments that we created were all based on the spaces that attract girls of that age. So, for example, there's, you know, there's an episode that is based around a, a sleepover. There is a cafe where they get together. There is in the periphery, because at this age, it's, it's really not that relevant, but there is in the periphery the boys and there's, a you know, a certain... Uh, not free zone, but uh, sort of competition with the boys. Right, right. And uh, there is conflict resolution. There is working together as a team. 
and all that stuff, which I think is what, um, you know, I don't know the genesis of the actual Lego Friends brand uh, in, in, you know, that, that has been recently uh, launched and that it, it's quite famous. But I think if there's anything that they probably picked up on is the sort of the universe of the girls and the character Bible, right. because it was very much rooted on the things that interest girls at that age. Guess what? There's a talent scout from Top 10 Records in town. Maybe we should practice our interview technique. Tell us how tough stuff got together. Well, we're all at school together. Boring! Put some sizzle into it. Give us a break, Jules. Now, Emma, where did you learn to dance? Well, I was one of Miss Trixie's Pixies. You're kidding! Miss Trixie's Pixies? Jules, tell us how you decided to play the drums. Oh, I just sort of... Go on. Okay, uh, I played the triangle in Grandpa Oompa's marching baby band. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like complete fools. <laughs> Called that. Want to help us make some music? Oh, yeah. Yeah! Yay! So you obviously were developing this game, but did so on the back of all this research you did. How much of that early research do you think impacted the design elements of the game? At the time, and obviously it's rained a lot since then, but at the time what emerged as the key activities that girls enjoyed in games and software, not just gaming per se, was uh, creation, customization, and collaboration. So those themes, I think, um, really come alive in, in this game right. through you know, composing the music, through the interactive narratives, through building up to this um, gig at the school, which is the kind of the, the, the aim of the game. Uh, it's interesting. Um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about sort of the impact, but I'm curious from your perspective and the perspective of your team, what was it you were hoping to achieve with the game? What, what were you hoping would happen with this game? Well, we obviously wanted to become a household name and uh, potentially start a series because there was a lot of uh, creative activity concepts that were not did not make it to this version. So, you know, serialization was definitely something that uh, was discussed. Um, but like everything, when you, you know, when you step into a new territory, you kind of want to suck it and see. I think we were all keen to see what reception this had and whether it really impacted on the, on the you know, girls' games market in the way that, for example, the Barbie products we're doing or, or uh, right. you know, other Mattel properties. Um, but it was not uh, followed on. And I think, you know, it came in 99 and it was uh, the start of a period of crisis for the Lego group. So I, I reckon priorities shifted at that time. And I think a lot of effort was put into licensing. Um, um, and, and it may well be why this was abandoned. Um, but, you know, I would really like to uh, know what the genesis was of the of the new Lego Friends and to what extent it is rooted in the original research that we did. Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, not only was there obviously a lot going on with the Lego group at the time, and it was, as you pointed out, sort of the beginning of this really difficult period for the company. But in the game industry, it was a very different industry than it is now. Absolutely. You know, Dreamcast was out. PlayStation 2, I think, had just been announced. Um, it was it was definitely much more focused on hardcore gamers. There were more boys playing games than girls. So you were coming into a field that wasn't really making games like this. Uh, did you hear anything anecdotally from people who were like happy that there was a game out there that that was sort of marketed and geared towards girls? To be perfectly honest, Brian, I really don't remember because this was quite a long time ago. Right. <laughs> but what I what I, I, I'm I'm so sorry. Um, but what I can say is, is that I think that at the time the Lego Group had not resolved the brand issues with girls. Right. And from that point of view, this was probably an experiment. Yeah. So you know, l looking past the, the launch of Lego Friends. It wasn't until 2012 that I think the modern Friends, uh, the new Lego Friends theme, was released. Um, I know that looking through some of the issues the Lego group was facing during that time period, uh, I came across this really startling figure uh, that in 2011, the Lego group was saying that 90% of consumers of Lego toys was boys. Yes. Uh, which is obviously a problem. 
2012 is when the modern Lego Friends theme comes out, and it sparks this huge conversation and a lot of pushback because of this whole discussion, which I think needed to happen, uh, which was this whole thing about the gender gap within Lego toys and how you construct toys for boys and girls. Uh, I guess if you boil it down, it would be why are pink toys for girls and blue toys for boys? Yes. So I'm just curious. You you obviously did a lot of research on this in the in the 90s. Um, what are your thoughts about sort of the lasting impact and and just how that era came about and and the, what came out of it? I think in terms of the kind of play that mm-hmm. the Lego Group promotes, it's it's genderless. Uh, whether it it's a, whether you're a boy or, or a girl, it's the kind of constructive, creative play that um, it's not gender specific. I think we are probably victims of marketing, really, and uh, commercial moves from, from the toys industry from the 80s onwards, where toys were marketed to boys and girls differently. Right. But if you look at 70s advertisements, for example, they, you know, you, you have both boys and girls equally playing with big boxes of Lego bricks. Right. I think licensing probably has also had a bearing on it. Um, there are licenses that are very clearly appealing to boys. And I think from that point of view, yes, Lego Friends is quite a gendered product. I don't think it's per se bad to devote spaces for girls and to um, create products for girls specifically. I think what is wrong is to assign, you know, specific colors and specific modes of play based on gender. Yeah, and I know that the the Lego group has done a lot since then. Uh, There was a, I think, a guide that they put out in 2012 because they recognized that there was this issue uh, that they had and that they needed to be a little more cognizant um, and then we had things like uh, the Research Institute, the Lego Research Institute, which I think a lot of people were very happy with. These were uh, Lego sets that featured women minifigs that were doing things like being research scientists or archaeologists. But it, it, it is interesting. Um, do, do you feel that um, while L- Lego Friends, the, the one that you worked on, was gendered, do you feel like that may have open their eyes a little bit to the fact that they need to be thinking more uh, broadly in terms of gender and toys? I think they were aware of it, to be honest. I think there was a commercial imperative to think about the, the, the market for girls. And like I said, this was a step towards that direction. And I think, you know, there was other concepts apart from these, and there was other concepts that were um, for, you know, later on the notice that I was marginally involved with for designing construction sets specifically for girls that didn't get anywhere. Do you ever sort of reminisce and, and or do you ever run across people who say that they have fond memories of playing Lego Friends? I, I see that a lot online when, when it com- the game comes up. I have not <laughs> looked into it. Um, not in my immediate circle, actually. I, uh, But, you know, if that is the case, I really love hearing about it. And I... You know, if if it's made girls happy and if it's given them hours of play and they've made lots of songs and created lots of dances and sat and uh, listened to the to the episodes, um, you know, that's great. That's what the game is for. I think if there's anything that um, the original Lego Friends game has left as a legacy, it is that idea of um, I. A universe created around girls' interests and and friendship and kind of light humor uh, and you know conflict resolution and and through play and uh, a common goal and friendship and uh, I think that's inspiring. that was a nice conversation, Brian. I really like Elena, and I I love talking and learning more about this game, and you're right. It's kind of this, you know, overlooked 
little gem that LEGO Games has. And uh, the big question here being, what were you able to find out about LEGO Friends theme sets? And uh, is there any connection to the 1999 video game? So it, I did I did uh, do some asking, and it sounds like there was no direct connection, uh-huh. uh, according to the people at the LEGO group that I spoke to. But I can't imagine that the game didn't have some sort of impact, even if it was just inspirational. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, while the game wasn't maybe the biggest hit uh, that was released by the LEGO group, it did contribute, I think, to the LEGO group's evolving examination of gender and play. You know, the 2012 release of LEGO Friends set sparked quite an international debate around the topic because some felt that LEGO sets shouldn't be gendered, you know? And, yeah. and the result was the LEGO group creating internal gender marketing guidelines and pushing to be more inclusive in all of its sets. Yeah, and uh, I think that they also welcomed some great fan-driven sets like that amazing Lego Kuso Research Institute, uh, which features these uh, women minifigures as paleontologists, uh, an astronomer, and a chemist. Yeah. And today, Lego Friends is a thriving product line from the Lego group with more than 250 sets, a range of books, an animated series, and yes, of course, even a new video game. And as we pointed out at the beginning of this episode, this format today is a little different than some of the others we've had. It is the first in a semi-regular series of conversations with remarkable people that were involved in the rich 25-year history of LEGO games. And if you have any suggestions for topics or games uh, we haven't covered, make sure to let us know. Bits and Bricks is made possible by LEGO Games. Our producer is Ronnie Scherer. Your hosts are Brian Crescente and Ethan Vincent. Episode producing and editing by Ethan Vincent. Writing by Brian Crescente. Mixing and sound design by Dan Carlisle. Original music by Peter Premier and Enric Lindstrand from the award-winning game Lego Builder's Journey, which you can play on Apple Arcade today. We'd like to thank our participant, Elena Caton, We'd also like to acknowledge the entire LEGO Games team, as well as the great folks at the LEGO Idea House for their support. For questions or comments, write us at bitsandbricks at lego.com. And as always, stay tuned for more episodes of Bits and Bricks. (laughs) 